Hi, my name is Elizabeth. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm really glad you're here because I read another super cool story that I would like to share with you. Um, I will do my best best to give you as spoiler free as I can and then I will end up telling you the entire story. Um, this book is called Comfort Me with Apples and it's by Catherine M. Valente, I believe. Yeah, I'm not great with the pronunciation of names. The most spoiler free I can give you is the story of a married woman. She lives in a gated community where all her desires are met. Okay, she can live the most contented life with her husband for whom she feels she was literally made. But she starts to find things in her house that don't belong to her. And therein lies the conflict and story. Um, but after I had listened to this three times in a row, because <laughs> it's so cool. Um, it's also really quick. It doesn't take a lot of time to read or listen to. I highly suggest checking it out. Um, when I looked sort of behind at the metaphor, this book is actually um, an explanation for how the creation story of the Garden of Eden is a direct link to our current misogynistic social norms. <laughs> is a direct link to our current misogynistic social norms. So I'm going to tell you the whole story, everything that happens, um, starting now. So join me for the ride. It's, it's the very beginning, and we meet Sophie. She lives in Acacia Gardens. It's a gated community. Um, and the, the rules, of course, are to live the most contented life. Um, safety and beauty abound. Rules like, um, if you would like to personalize your domicile, you may choose from one of the following colors. Eggshell. Ecru. Off-white. Wedding. Cream. Ivory. <laughs> I'm pretty sure those are all off-white colors, <laughs> but okay. Um, your roof can be either brown or gray. <laughs> so it's very controlled, um, but if you want to live a happy, innocent, ignorant, and therefore content life, you have to have a lot of rules um, telling you exactly what to do. And um, so I think that this story is really about this woman discovering um, that she doesn't want to follow the rules. Okay, so we meet Sophie. She's getting ready for her day. She wakes up. She's in this ginormous bed, like so big that she describes to us that her husband had to fashion stairs so that she could get in and out of this bed. Okay. So she goes over to her dressing table, and, um, and this is the first, she admits that, um, that she has a deception to her husband already. Like, this is, we haven't met anybody, anything. It's apparently the beginning, and she already has a deception. Now, the deception is, it's a little white lie. It's a little nothing. So her husband believes that a clean face is the most beautiful version of a face. So... It's okay if she he thinks that she wakes up glowing. You know, that's just fine. She can use her little bronzer, her little blush, her little bit of lip color that she has. That's all she has. Three little pots of makeup um, that just enhance the littlest bit. You know, he doesn't need to know. It's a little white lie. It's a nothing. As she's sitting at this grand um, dressing table, she realizes she has three pots of makeup and a huge dressing table with drawers upon drawers you know, three on each side at least she doesn't need more than one what in the world are all of these drawers for like what's the deal here so she opens up one of them and in it she finds a hairbrush that is way way too big for her hand it is it's not something she would be able to really wield also it has a lock of black hair tied with a white ribbon now, Sophie's hair is a soft caramel color. It's nowhere near as coarse. This hair is clearly off of some other woman's head. 
Sophie tries not to think about it. She knows she's the only one in her husband's world. She's she's his everything. She he, she was made literally for him. She feels, um, so she tries to um, not think about it. And she heads downstairs. Now the stairs are a whole other thing. The stairs take her half an hour to to transverse because the stairs are near. Each stair is nearly as tall as she is. So like this so far this house does not seem to be made for her when she sits at the dining room table her legs swing you know she has to climb up and then her legs swing she's like this house is not the right size for her but she doesn't quite get that yet so she talks about how she spends her days cooking and cleaning there's different you know different days you polish different things um and that she always makes sure that dinner is ready and on the table whether her husband comes home or not it doesn't matter she always makes sure that it's there She's she's cleaning up after um, the, the, the meal she's made and, um, you know, putting in the little bit of um, cutlery that she uses. She eats very little. Um, so she's cleaning everything up. She cleans, she cleans the knives and she puts it back in the block and it makes a noise and it doesn't go all the way in. Like there's something blocking it from going all the way into its normal position. And so she tips the block over, and this little piece of, hmm, I'm not sure what it is, she thinks to herself, falls out. She inspects it, and she realizes that even though she's trying to convince herself, it's a chicken bone. It got stuck on the knife, and, and that's how it ended up in the, she was just being, I mean, she's clearly not taking the time to really clean correctly, right? It must be her fault. But the more she inspects it, the more she realizes it's really the tip of a, of a human finger. Why in the world is there a tip of a human finger in their knife block? Nope. She's content. Her world is to be content, and she is content. She, in fact, is going over to her neighbor's house for tea this afternoon, so she's not going to get distracted by this strange thing she's just gonna go have a lovely afternoon with her neighbors she's going to have tea with miss lyon mrs lyon mrs Hare, mrs gibbon and mrs mink they um they're gonna discuss silly women's things nothing of actual importance okay so they uh sophie worries a little bit about who else her husband might have contact with and this is because of the hair that he found she found um, you know, like, who whose hair is this, right? She's getting worried. She's maybe jealous, maybe, like, should I trust him? Should I not trust Like, she's she's worried. And it's, like, the first time she's ever been worried about her husband, and so she doesn't quite know what to do about it. And the women tell her that her husband absolutely looks at nobody else but her. She is the only woman he ever sees. Like, the, she's the only woman here, at one point they say. And um, Mrs. Lyon says, what I have noticed, though, is that all of our husbands notice you. That's how lovely you are. You are so wonderful and lovely that all of our husbands notice you. But your husband only ever sees you. Okay. So they bid her goodbye, and they say that they will see her later at the pantomime performance that evening. Her, so this is, uh, this evening, her husband actually comes home. It's the first time that he's come home at the beginning, since this story started. And he walks in, and he says, I am home. I am here. Where is my wife? <laughs> it's very like, okay, I'm sure you've been waiting for me for days. Like, you don't have any point in living besides reacting to me, and I'm here, so let's go. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, of course, she races to him. She leaps into his arms, and all is right with the world, and they enjoy each other and whatnot. And then, um, and she serves him dinner, and he responds to some of the things she's saying about, like, you're just trying to butter me up. I know you don't really mean any of these things. And she's like, how can you say such a thing to me? I absolutely think you are wonderful. You are wonderful. You are the most wonderful thing ever. I'm not trying to, how can it be buttering you up when it's true? He's like, oh, you're so sweet, and you're so, you're just your little head, and you sweet thing. He says, you know, I know you want me to take you to the pantomime. And she says, well, you are my everything, and you are wonderful, so while I do want to go to the pantomime, that doesn't mean that what I'm saying to you isn't true. He laughs at her. He promises her that they'll go. She'll, she'll watch the pantomime. He'll watch her. Everyone will be happy. So they go to the pantomime. Um, and it is a reenactment of Sophie's very first day at Acacia Gardens. Mrs. Lyons, I believe, is the one playing her. 
So she's, it's clearly her house. She can see that the sets are her house. She can see that Mrs. Lyons is sitting at her dressing table. This is her dressing table that she uses. But the wig that she's wearing is long and black and coarse. That's not Sophie's hair. So is she playing Sophie? Is she not playing Sophie? What exactly is happening here? And she looks over at her husband and he seems upset. You know the thing where like the clenching happens here? <laughs> You know? Or the um, the look on the face is is oh no he's not he's not happy. Um, when she questions him about his discomfort, she he totally snaps at her, which he has never done to her ever. He's never snapped at her, and he says to himself, "Well, this was foolish. I don't know why I came to this. I've got too much work to do, and now I have to catch up. And I I just shouldn't have I shouldn't have." gone in for this foolishness. This is women's foolishness. You stay. You enjoy. There's nothing. I want you to dance and eat and celebrate with the neighbors and have a great time tonight, but this is this is not for me. And he sort of leaves in a huff, and she stays, and she does. She she dances and she eats and she, um, you know, she's fed all these wonderful delicacies by the neighbors and it's just this beautiful, wonderful, you know, fun experience that she has with her neighbors. But when she gets home, and her husband is not home because, you know, he has to go work, she can't get rid of those thoughts, those, there was, you know, black hair tied up with a ribbon, and then the woman who played me was wearing black, like, there's just too many things that are just needling sort of away at her, and she, (laughs) it sounds like, literally, takes her house apart probably wasn't literally, but like (laughs) she goes through every page in every book, takes apart, she takes everything out of every cabinet, every cupboard. Um, She, she looks through everything. When she looks at what she's found, she sees, you know, there's the tip of the finger, a molar, a kneecap, a shin bone, four teeth still attached to a jawbone, an old dried out spleen, a human heart, and locks of hair tied with white bows, so many that she can create an entire color wheel for all the colors hair can be. There's just so many of them. And she just looks at it and thinks, what is going on? Thought this was my home, but literally there are parts of women everywhere. (laughs) What is going on? So he comes home from dinner that night and, um, and she asks him what he does when he's not with her. And he, I mean, the minute she asked that question, his head whips to her. It's like, why would you ask such a thing? Why are you asking me such a thing? I don't understand. What do you need? What, why are you, you know, he's really upset that she's asking questions. When he sort of figures out that it's because she's worried that he could be with another woman during the times he's away from her, he starts to laugh at her. He says, you are so silly. There is no one else in this entire world for me. You're like, you have, there's no reason for you to even worry. You're a silly little thing. It's all good. It's the next night and she finds herself sort of wandering in this, um, community. She's, she's, you know, taking a walk and trying to think things through. And she sort of looks up and realizes she doesn't know where she is. And so she's looking for um, street signs to try to place herself. Throughout the entire book, uh, each, you're given more and more of the acacia rules. So you get a little bit of the rules at, you know, at chapter one, and then you get a little bit of the rules at chapter three, and then a little bit of them at chapter, we know, like, as it goes, you get more rules. And at this point, um, we hear the rules. While all fruit is welcome to be eaten, eaten, there is one tree in the back area of the community where you may not eat of that fruit. And of course, by the time you get there, it's painfully obvious that they're in the Garden of Eden. Um, but it creeps up on you. Like, I'm, I, to be completely honest, like, I can't even remember exactly what it was that I was like, oh my God, um, this is the Garden of Eden. Um, she finds herself in front of that strange tree. Okay. And she's like, oh, I'm, 
I'm over by that tree you're not allowed to eat off of. Okay. And this strange man approaches and the way he's described is so serpentine. Like it's so cool. Like he, she, she, he, he shakes her hand and he, she thinks that his skin is so coarse. It's almost scaly. And, um, and they have this conversation about um, who she is and what she's doing in the garden. Um, and whether she's got questions, whether she has curiosity, whether um, she wants to know, she was uh, whether she's looking for answers, whether she's not looking for answers. If he can ask her three questions and she answers them as best she can, and he says, "Well, I have one more question for you," you know, and I'm I've been known to not be completely honest, so that's just how that goes. Um, can you tell me the n- first name of your husband? I mean, he is your husband. What's his first name? Um, she doesn't know. She can't grasp it. So he starts talking about how she was made in such a way that she will search for answers, even if she cannot or will not answer, ask the question. He's hoping that she doesn't want to know anything, that she's perfectly content to not have any answers. But of course she's not. And she asks, she says, tell me my husband's name. And the man says, your husband's name is Adam, of course. Yeah, the number one, the first human, the favorite son of God. And and he is your husband. And she was absolutely made for him, 100%, to complete him, to be anything and everything for him. And to not wonder what may have come before or what is outside the gates or what Adam does when she's not with him. That is not her purpose. Her purpose is to be there for him. She doesn't need to worry about these things. She just needs to be content and in love. I think it was at about this point that I remembered that at the tea party, the tea was made from apple blossoms. And that when she's at the pantomime, they feed her, one of the things they feed her is like an apple cake. So she's been getting like little bits of apple before she's even in front of the tree. The man tells her to take a bite of the apple if she truly wants answers. And of course she does. She wants to know. She can't stop herself from it. So she bites down into the apple and bites into a key. And the man says, this is the key to the basement of your house. This is, you know, that the one that your husband says is not safe for you to visit and the one where you're not allowed to go. And here's the key. And he sends her home with an apple to feed Adam and hopes that she's able to get him to eat of it uh, because so then she's home and Adam returns to the house and he summons her to a discussion because um, he sees that the basement door is open. She's been cooking for him for the last few hours and she brings him a steaming hot piece of pie. And he's sort of resigned. He's not that, oh, Sophie, you're the greatest thing that ever happened to me, man, anymore. He's just sort of resigned, and he's like, okay, so I can explain all of this to you then. He tells her that she's nowhere near the first woman that he's had. That when Adam was new, when he was so much bigger than he even is now, he was a giant. It was, he was brand new. The world was new. The, 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 you know, the, the waves are just first crashing onto the sand that he and his other half were actually attached by the back. Now, this is um, a creation story, the idea being that we were these great barrel-chested monster beasts things that um, had uh, four legs, four arms, two heads, and we were fused on, at, our, at our back. And um, the, the, sto- you know, the story goes, well, um, cut them in half and sent them to the for, you know, corners of the earth so that, that they would be have to spend their whole lives trying to find each other. And this is where the concept of a soulmate, another half, comes from. So what Adam is saying is the very first woman that he was ever, or partner he ever had, was attached to his back. So he couldn't see her. He couldn't touch her. He couldn't please himself upon her. Men are gross. Sorry. Not all of them. A lot of them. Um, so because he couldn't touch her, which, there, I mean, how is that supposed to work? He says to Sophie, like, how, how is that ever going to be a, a successful relationship if I can't touch her? I talked to my dad and I said, hey, split us apart. And so he did because I am his number one son and I, what I ask for, I get. But she was mad. 
Can you believe it, Sophie? She was pissed. She seemed to think that I needed to get her consent before we got divided. But I'm the number one. I'm the son. I get what I want. But she refused to have anything to do with him. She would not touch him. She wouldn't go anywhere near him. And, I mean, he was trying to solve the problem so that they could touch each other, and now she won't touch him, so forget it. So he asks his father to make him a new woman. And, of course, he does. So the first one is banished, gone. I don't know. We don't really talk about it. She's gone. And now he's decided, okay, well, let's have you truly understand what you're made of and what the woman that you're going to be with is made of. So, um, and this is, uh, this is another piece of a creation story that a lot of, you know, some of the major religions use that, um, the second (laughs) female that was made for Adam was created in front of him. So it, it literally was the First, he saw the, you know, the toes of the skeleton all the way, you know, create all the way up into the head of the skeleton. And then um, this, then the sinew and the um, organs and the blood and the mucus and the juice and, the th- and you know, until there was skin. And then, you know, so he sees every little bitty part of what both of them really are. And he finds her to be grotesque and disgusting he describes her as gross and wet and how like he can't see her as anything more than just like the liquid that he didn't really think about and and Sophie says to him but you have the same stuff in you and he's like well but what does that have to do with anything she was gross (laughs) oh Okay. Uh Uh-huh. A little narcissistic, I have to say. Then he says that he and his father started making women from all different things. There was a woman made from feathers. There was a woman made from stars. There was a woman made from sunlight. There was a woman made from, you know, and none of these were working. And so they got together and they decided that maybe since Adam was such a resounding success, that the women should be made from him. So he would get these new women that were made from a piece of him and he would instantly fall in love with them. I mean, it was, it was amazing how he just instantly, they, it was, he could see the part of him that was in them and he loved, you know, himself so he could love them. And it was just, but somehow it always fell apart somewhere. They wanted, they couldn't stay content. They had questions. They, you know, wouldn't listen to him. They wanted, had their own opinions, they, wh- whatever it was. Um, and his father got really aggravated with him and was like, I'm not getting rid of these women for you anymore. If you want a new woman, fine, I'll make you new women, but I'm not getting rid of them for you anymore. And Adam says, you know, at first it was real gross. It was real repulsive to try to have to like get rid of them. But now I'm at the point where I, like, I time myself to see how quickly I can do it. I mean, it's, it's no big deal. And, and then what I do is I take all their parts and I hide them in the garden and in the house. And they just go into the walls. He tells her this is how he can visit them and never forget them and still have, you know, the parts of them that, that he loved. You know, that second woman who he never even named, he has a vial of her blood because that's all she ever really was to him. As far as I gather, he took a, kept a lock of hair from each one of them. So that's why there's so many. And when you step away from the story at this point, you're like, oh, wait a minute. So Adam is a serial killer. Yeah, the first man is a serial killer. He's trying to make the perfect woman and she's not, it's not working out. And... Clearly, the women are getting smaller and smaller and smaller because Sophie needs stairs to get up to the bed. (laughs) At this point, Adam is a serial killer of his wives. He tells Sophie that, um, that she's lasted so much longer than the last girl. That the last girl, like, she wouldn't listen to anything he said. She wouldn't listen. She wouldn't. 
she wouldn't agree with his opinions. She wouldn't do what he said. She, I mean, she just defied him at every step. And he says, but I did name her. Her name was Lilith. She didn't last. I'm like, ooh. Okay, now we've got a name. We've got Lilith. Okay. Now, we've all heard of, well, hopefully, most of us have heard of Lilith as coming before Eve. And she wouldn't obey. And so that's why she was sent away. And then there's the the story that Naama, which was the one who was created um, in front of him, was created. And he thought that was she was gross. And that's how we ended up with Eve. But in this story, <laughs> Lilith is actually the last woman that he had. Sophie's his current. Okay. So he says to Sophie, you were made out of my eye. And he takes his hand. It's very interesting the way it's described. Like he takes his hand and it's sort of like he makes the magic go away. And she can see that it's droopy and missing like mass. And then he puts his hand back and it's like the magic comes back and he's perfectly handsome and beautiful again. Um, he tells her that she shouldn't worry. He'll always remember her. But he'll make sure that no one else ever knows that she even existed. So it's, you know, it's not going to, she's not going to cause pain to anyone. Like, he's just going to remember her fondly. And she doesn't need to worry because that's all that matters. It's all how it affects, how she affects Adam. And it has nothing to do with who she is as a person. And he says, you know, maybe the next woman that, you know, my father makes for me will do it all correctly. Um, and she says, well, but I'm confused because I'm, I'm made of the same stuff you are. And God, the father is my father as much as he's your father. And Adam's response to that is so, what does that have to do with anything? The world was made for me. The world was made for me. I'm God's firstborn. I'm the whole reason the world got made. It only matters how I feel. What is, how you feel factor into any of this? Um, which is when the, she does one that last ditch effort to get him to eat some of the pie that she has made for him that she's been baking all day. He throws it across the room. Then he, um, embraces her until her eyes bulge and pop and she is no more. And just before the novel ends, we find out that the new woman's name is Eve. And that's how it ends. So I really do think that this is a way of describing where the rampant misogyny um, has come from in our society, um, especially in terms of the creation story. I mean, given a world and said, this is all for you. And that included his partner. So instead of her being equal, she was just another one of the things that was given to him. That is just a fascinating interpretation of that story. But this, fascinating. Fascinating. And I love that she has a deception before anything even really starts. You know, like she hasn't been given any of the apple blossom tea when she has her three little pots of makeup. So from the very beginning, she's got secrets from him. And something that is made for him, 100% to be for him, shouldn't have secrets from him. But because she's made of the same things that he is, she can't see the world that way. She sees the world the way Adam does. Like, this is a beautiful world and this is what I can do with it. Um, so it's just fascinating. It gives a lot of thought. I mean, I literally listened to it three times in a row. Like the first time I was like, oh, it's the Garden of Eden. And so when I listened to it again, I was like, oh, they're giving her apple blossom tea. <laughs> oh my God, she's eating apple cake. This is so cool. Um, you know, and, and the names that they give to the different characters are really significant and cool also, but I don't want to give you everything. Like go and experience it. It is so cool. Um, I really, really liked this one a lot. It's called Comfort Me with Apples by Catherine M. Val Valente. I think that's how you pronounce it. If I'm not pronouncing that right, I apologize.
immensely. Um, again, great, awesome, amazing book. I loved it and quick. It's pretty, pretty easy, quick read. Um, just thick and a lot to think about. Do me a favor and uh, be nice to each other out there, okay? And, and be nice to yourself. It's really important. And I'll catch you next time. Bye. Hey!